So, okay, I finally got the best list together. Always takes me a bit, always comes out a little late, but I have my best hits of the year. And every year it gets a little harder because what even is a hit anymore? See, I started reviewing music entirely to talk about overplayed songs I heard on the radio over and over again. And that's just not how music works anymore. A few years ago I made the counterintuitive take that actually albums weren't dying, they were more important than ever. That may have been a little premature, but I think it's true now. Increasingly, the singles charts look like album charts. Individual songs don't have the ubiquity that they used to, and the Hot 100 tends to measure the popularity of the artist more than the song. Even TikTok hits are drifting away from no names and towards the very famous. It is now incredibly hard to break the top 10 without being one of the most famous people alive. So, even though I've opened up my eligibility for what I consider a hit this year, I still kind of don't know what I'm looking at. This was a bit of an odd year. One where the shadow of COVID loomed large even after everyone got back to their lives. We were all awkward, stumbling back into some semblance of normalcy, and that's what this year in music felt like. Or maybe I'm projecting, because this is an awkward list. <laughs> Boy, you'll see. So let's get to it. We're counting down! The top 10 best hit songs of 2022. Number 10. And we fancy like Applebee's on a date night. Got that Bourbon Street stay with the Oreo shake. Yes, that's right. I have changed my mind about fancy like and put it in its proper place on the best list. No, I'm kidding. God, 2021 was a bad year for country music. 2022, meanwhile, is looking like it may go down as one of Nashville's best. I guess the redneck listeners of the country and western world got fed up with trap beats and TikTok dances, so a lot of new names are popping up, with a much more raw, stripped down sound. I saw one article call it Ronky Tonk, I will not be calling it that until I'm forced to, but a lot of people think this might be the next big thing, country with a more rock sound. Guess it's funny that my favorite of them was by a guy who wasn't country or rock. I never get lonely. I got these goals to keep me company. I this big, gross looking guy with the face tattoo goes by the name Jelly Roll. Believe it or not, despite his weathered, soulful voice and gentle acoustic backing, he is, in fact, a rapper. There's a monster under my bed, and at my window, there's a dragon. Well, kind of. He definitely has some other influences in there, which I think for some of you this might be a tough sell. I realize I'm making him sound like either Deep Fried Post Malone or Jumbo Size Kid Rock. This, his first crossover hit, is definitely not either of those things. I'm just a long haired son of a sinner, searching for new ways I can get gone. It's an honest to god acoustic ballad about doing too many drugs and hoping for forgiveness. It's also the most religious song I've ever put on the best list. I'm only one drink away from the devil. I'm only one call away from home. I've had people tell me that maybe I'm a little too harsh on Christian music. I know I do tend to react negatively when I get a whiff of churchiness from songs. Hmm. Don't like that. Jesus, take the lead. Nope. Yeah, and I'm sorry, what, what is this? Yeah, don't try to convert me, Blue Oyster Cult. Stick your pamphlet somewhere else. But this one I like a lot. These back roads got me. These pills pretend to be my friend. Maybe I can only take religious stuff when it's mixed with a lot of talk about doing drugs. That's how they get you. Mistakes are made, I paid for them in cash. Walked a million miles on broken glass. And he's pretty clear that he sees drugs and God as basically the same thing, a way to try to find peace. I mean, I like that, I won't lie. So that's how you get me, evangelicals. More sad drinking songs by big fat guys with face tattoos. Yeah, try sending one of those to my doorstep. You know, he says he's a long-haired son of a sinner, but his hair's not actually that long. Number nine. There's a like a running joke about hip hop 
about how every year the big songs and big albums are just the same five or six guys appearing on each other's tracks. I really felt that this year, and it was kind of hard for me to get too excited about the bigger rap releases. Like, was the Drake 21 Savage album any good? Honestly, yeah, for the most part. It's just, I, I just can't get excited about it. I've heard too much of both these guys these last couple of years, separately and together. I'm just a little burnt out, I guess. So, uh, I suppose that it's not that surprising that one of my favorite rap songs of the year came from someone I have never heard of before. I'm L R E E for nigga free. That mean I ain't got a word by no fuck nigga cheap. And I'm S I N G L E again. Y'all start hanging out the window with my wretched ass friends. This is Memphis rapper Glorilla, and um, I'm gonna be straight with you guys. I don't know shit about Glorilla. She knew. I probably should have done more research before now, but uh, I'm always a little slower to hip hop. I heard this song all summer and months afterwards, and it wasn't till this season where I was like, hey, wait a minute, this whips ass. G to the L to the O beat glow. You can FNF is basically all chorus, and it just barely crosses two minutes, so let's say it doesn't really need to be deeply analyzed. If you want to know what it means, well, it of course stands for Five Nights at Freddy's. No, I cannot say what it actually means out loud. Let us say that it is a celebration of being rid of useless men. And it's kind of nice to see that some experiences are universal. Like really, I shouldn't enjoy this song. I've never had to worry about fuckboys, and when I'm happy about being single, it involves a lot less twerking and a lot more video games. And yet, I feel it completely. Let's go! And this is such a stupid point I'm about to make, but there's a right way and a wrong way to spell words in a song. My biggest problem with Nicki Minaj's super freaky girl is that when she spells out the word freak, it has like the opposite of a ring to it, but this just kind of like perfectly scans. I don't know, like usually I like the more pop end of hip hop, but as every main rap girl tries to be the next Doja Cat, I don't know, I'm gravitating more towards this crunk throwback. Like I do think it's funny that the producer is credited first, which uh, that's probably the last time that happens for Glorilla, seeing as she and Hit Kid immediately fell out over royalties. But it looks like she's gonna be maybe one of the next big things. I mean, I hope so. I'd like to be ahead of the game for once. 2023, the year of Glorilla. Let's go! Number eight. Okay, so, um, just fair warning. For what I think is the first time ever, I put a second country song on the list. I mean, I told you, it was a good year for country music. Like, I don't know if my viewership of Ariana Grande fans cares about that. What can I tell you? I've been doing this a long time. You are free to tune out before these lists become all Lawrence Welk. I know it ain't all that. Actually, whether this is country or not is debatable. In February, You Should Probably Leave became only Chris Stapleton's second number one on country radio, which I guess is a tiny bit surprising. You'd think he'd have more considering his level of acclaim and respect, but respect and success don't necessarily have that much in common, and I kind of get the sense there's some distance between him and Nashville. Even veteran star Alan Jackson said Stapleton is more rock than country. And I admit, I've always kind of held Stapleton at a distance too as he racks up awards and Tennessee whiskey becomes a TV talent show staple. Reminds me less of country than the kind of tasteful blues that racked up Grammys in the early 90s, like Bonnie Raid, Eric Clapton, Latter Day James Taylor, stuff for aging gatekeepers still pretending that their preferred style of music was relevant. On the obvious counterpoint, Bonnie Raitt made a lot of great fucking songs, and it is not any kind of insult to say that this reminds me a lot of Bonnie Raitt. Out of Chris Stapleton's admittedly impressive catalog, this is his best song. Because you know what? Grown people need sexy music too. And it's hard to resist. All right, just don't kiss. I mean, what's hotter than two people trying not to have sex? And then, you know, having sex. You want me to stay, that I want you to stay, so you should. 
should probably leave. I mean, I assume that she should probably leave for, you know, one of the fun reasons, like she's cheating on someone. Not like, you should probably leave because I'm your parole officer or something terrible like that. And one of the amazing things I found while looking at this on YouTube, one of the first videos that comes up is of him performing this in 2014. He's been sitting on this since Obama was president. Amazing. I would have released it right away, because this song fucks. We know this is gonna be. Mostly I just admire the song's simplicity. Money beat, basic lyrical structure. It feels like one of those pure, timeless songs that's always existed. It's just a perfectly sketched portrait of two people who are definitely going to exercise some bad judgment. Let's give it up for bad judgment, everyone. And then we should probably move on. Number seven. Anyway. Truth is, I had begun to worry about Lizzo's long-term viability as a musician. I was hearing a lot about her TV show, her fashion line, not a whole lot about her music. And it seemed like maybe she'd just become like a Jessica Simpson style, all-purpose celebrity where you kind of just forgot why she was famous to begin with. And in a world where pop stars are supposed to have big first weeks or it's instantly over, it might surprise you to know that this song stumbled right out of the gate. Like, Lizzo, are, are we even still talking about her? Like, that was a pre-pandemic thing, right? But then Lizzo told us what damn time it was. Is that bitch a clock? Yeah, it's thick. And we made some time for her. The thing is, you can always make up for lost momentum by having fucking jams. And after a slow crawl up the charts, it became Lizzo's second number one hit. It's been a minute, tell me how you're healing. It seems like Lizzo is such a huge personality that she should have a more devoted fan base, and she shouldn't have to take the Katy Perry, Bruno Mars path to stardom, but... You know what? There are definitely worse ways to be famous than by having a bunch of really good songs. Oh, and another thing she and Bruno Mars have in common. Excellent backup singers. Okay. And not only did this hit number one, it also vindicates Juice, the Lizzo song it resembles most. The one that put Lizzo on the map but was surprisingly not ever much of a hit. At last, Justice. It's about damn time. It's about damn time. And just as I used Lizzo to insult Megan Trainer on the worst list, I'm gonna use Megan's example to show what Lizzo does right. This ain't that ordinary, this that 14 carat cake. Partly it's because Lizzo crafts one-liners much better than Megan does. Feeling fussy, walking in my Balenciennes, trying to And partly it's because when Lizzo goes retro, she just does it better. She makes it sound alive and modern and not shrink-wrapped and dead. Bitch! I mean, that groove. And at last, Lizzo gets to put her flute skills to use on record. I, I know she can play, but I double-checked the album credits to make sure that she didn't put in a ringer here and she's just lip-syncing, which you can do with a flute, lip-sync. But yeah, that is actually her playing that. That's awesome. But I think the most amazing thing is that I know Lizzo has down days. Some of her most famous songs she said she's written to cheer herself up but I have never once listened to her and thought that she was faking it. That's what makes her such a pick-me-up for everyone. She just believes in herself, and she makes you believe in yourself. Okay, all right. Number six. <laughs> the World Health Organization, Joe, announcing last week that the end is in sight for the COVID-19 pandemic. We the pandemic, I guess, more or less ended officially in 2022, but its shadow was still all over the music of this year. I've been cool Most of the releases from the big names were clearly written during the lockdowns while they were trapped in their mansions going nuts. I don't think this was more obvious for anyone than it was for Kendrick Lamar, who was probably already struggling with his own thoughts before the lockdowns. And when he finally made his big return, it was with a very challenging, messy, and uncommercial album with a ridiculous name. Some fabricate streams and a microwave memes. It's a real world outside. At first, it was flooded with five-star reviews, and then after a week or so when the hype died down, everyone was like, actually, what is this? Fuck you, nigga. Nah, fuck you, bitch. Fuck you, nigga. Fuck you, fuck, fuck you, fuck, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. It certainly wasn't uncompelling, but it was a lot to process. And I guess it shouldn't be that surprising that my favorite Kendrick song this year was not on that album at all. He 
Before he drops a new album, Kendrick usually heralds its arrival with a standalone track called The Heart. I come from a generation of pain will murder his minor rebellion. This year's edition, The Heart Part 5, got a bigger entrance than it usually does. A big video for it and everything. It only charted briefly before getting overwhelmed by the album, but it was honestly the one I went back to the most. New GoFundMe accounts to proceed, a brand new victim of shattered those dreams, the culture. Now, I feel a little basic putting this on the list. A music critic who likes Kendrick Lamar. Whoo, jaw dropper. And Kendrick rapping about the culture over a 70s soul sample is, I mean, it's basically Kendrick playing the hits. For anyone who wanted to pimp a butterfly too, still pimping, this was the closest you were gonna get from him. So I do feel a little obvious going for this more digestible track, but I think the song is actually honestly good beyond just being what you expect from Kendrick. If you listen more closely, the heart part five kind of reveals itself as the opening salvo of a man desperately unsure of his own place despite his pedestal. In a land where no equal is your equal, never say I ain't told you. Nah, in a land where hurt people hurt more people, fuck calling it culture. It's worth noting that in the video, he deep fakes other controversial black celebrities over his face. Will Smith, OJ, Kanye, men who were heroes until they weren't. The song's about a lot of things, but in conjunction with the album and with the deep fakes and the sample, you know, I want you to want me to. It strikes me as mostly about Kendrick struggling with his relationship with his audience. Like, what does Kendrick want? I don't know if he knows. And then there's the stunner final verse, where he transforms into his dead friend Nipsey Hussle. As I bleed through the speakers, feel my presence. To my brother, to my kids, I'm in heaven. And starts rapping from his point of view, telling all his loved ones what he feels for them, even forgiving the man who shot him. Know your soul's in question. I seen the pain in your pupil when that trigger had squeezed. And though you did me gruesome, I was surely relieved. I completed my mission, wasn't ready. Oh, man, that's hard. That's, that's powerful, woof. Look what I done for you. Look what I done for you. I expected I was gonna have to work hard to justify this placement since I figured everyone had forgotten this song in the wake of the more Think PC album. But as it turns out, people hadn't forgotten it at all. It was on a lot of other people's top 10 lists. It got nominated for Grammys. Like, and I don't want to discount the album, which was, you know, interesting and challenging. But sometimes you gotta let a song hit you in the heart. And though my physical won't reap the benefits, the energy they carry on admit still, I want you. Number five. Three. Three country songs. Look, I don't know why you watch me. I didn't tell you to watch me. You clicked on this of your own free will, okay? You can marry an architect. Build you a house out on the water. Oh, and looky here, we have saved the most embarrassing for last. I wish I could bring you another weathered, gnarly beard guy for the final country song. Instead, this is by Sam Hunt, a bedroom eyes boyfriend country beefcake who looks like he should be a quarterback on the cover of a football themed romance novel, and who is most famous for one of the worst country hits of the last 10 years. Your body reminds me of Bad Road. Still infuriating. You'll always have long blonde hair. You'll always be Memphis Queen. Well, he finally got me. Oh, with those soulful eyes and those broad shoulders. <sighs> no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I'll never be 23 with anyone but you. Hunt is controversial among country critics for mixing things like DJ scratches and trap beats and samples in his music in a way that's really tacky. This is something different, although it's not very country either. It's it's some kind of like country disco 70s pop thing. But you'll never be 23 with anyone but me. Immediately that smooth groove caught me and you know, what can I tell you? I'm a sucker for bittersweet reminiscences. I really hope you're happy now. I'm really glad I knew you then. If the Chris Stapleton song was for grown-ups, this song is about how, you know, young love is nice too. And you can have fond memories of past romances without necessarily letting it destroy your life. We'll always have full beach. We'll always have delta nights. Like I said, it's kind of very much an embarrassing song to share. 
Believe it or not, I managed to not look up my high school girlfriend on Facebook and send her any messages while listening to this. But for me, this song doesn't necessarily remind me of anyone specific. It's it's just an acknowledgement that adult fun isn't the same thing as young fun. You probably got an office view, wearing those skirts you always hated. And don't get me wrong, there are many things I don't miss about being 23. And I can easily imagine this woman saying to her new husband, like, thank God you didn't know me when I was 23. Oh, I was dating this meathead who kept comparing my body to a back road. You always have your first last name Standing in that July rain Telling me your mind has changed I mean, songs about being okay with the past, they, they, they hit me, right? Like, I guess you could say there's kind of a possessive vibe to it, like, you know, don't forget, I hit it first. Which, I mean, I guess I do hear it, but I just simply choose not to take it that way. I mean, why not? It's a song about remembering things in a probably nicer way than they deserve, so that's the way I'm rolling with this. One of my guiltiest pleasures of the year. You can marry who you want, go back to Tennessee, but you'll never be 23 with anyone but me. I put this higher than Kendrick. You are free to stop watching. I never said I had good taste. I have repeatedly said the opposite, all right? Well, that was humiliating. Next. Number four. Okay, we are at the point of the list where over the course of the year at various points, I was sure that all of the following songs was going to be my number one. So you can basically call the rest of the list a tie for first. But in a more accurate sense, I did also rank them in order. So this is my number four. And boy, what a year where this is only at number four. This is insane to think about, but Beyonce went the entire 2010s without a real major crossover pop hit. Now that's an extremely relative term, obviously. Her songs did chart at least, her albums were still huge, and any random song from them is probably considered a modern classic. And quite frankly, I much prefer this era to her previous decade as an omnipresent hitmaker. But still, it's a conspicuous absence that she's gone this long without a crazy in love, an irreplaceable, a halo, you know, songs so big that even great grandma knew them. Break My Soul absolutely should have been it. It is the best standalone single Beyonce has released in years. This could have been the biggest song in the world, and should have, and would have, except for the fact that Beyonce has done about zero to promote it. For Lemonade, she released an entire visual album. For this one, she's not even on tour yet. No TV appearances, no interviews, there's not even a video for it, nothing. You get nothing. Queen B has no need to pander to you peasants. You'll probably get something this year from her, but maybe you won't. You will get whatever scrap she gives you, and you'll like it. And despite the zero promotion, Break My Soul was still pretty goddamn big. I mean, it's an early 90s house song that sounds like it came right off the Pose soundtrack. It was targeted directly at her gay fan base. They alone could have played this song enough times to make it a hit. But it's also just a phenomenal song in its own right. And speaking of the early 90s, I feel like I should note the one real act of promotion she did do. Of die hating. <gasps> I remember one article after Madonna's kiss in 2003 saying that neither Britney or Christina was the true heir to the material girl. It was actually Beyonce. I wish I could find that article because this person was way ahead of everybody. Beyonce is her own woman of course, but Madonna was exactly who I thought of when I heard that last album. And so when she released The Queen's remix, which mashed up this song with Madonna's Vogue, I thought it was just the most natural thing in the world. And it also kicked ass. If I counted it as a separate song, I might very well put the remix on this list too. And the thing is, when Madonna reached this point in her career, that's when she started to lose a step. Like, believe it or not, it wasn't impossible for that to happen to Beyonce. I remember listening to her in 2018, copying Migos' flow, doing the skirt skirt. Pay me an equity, pay me an equity. Watch me reverse out of dick. Skirt. He got a and I'm like, is this what's gonna happen to Beyonce? Just trend chasing for the rest of her career? Hell the fuck no. You 
Funny thing is, this is a song about having a shitty job and battling adversity in a way that, on paper, sounds like Beyonce taking herself off the pedestal, making herself not as queenly and untouchable as she has been all her career, putting herself more on ground level like Lizzo. And yet, at the end of it, she was more Queen B than ever. It's still Beyonce's world, and we're all still just living in it. Number three. The next song I'm going to play, I have to dedicate to each and every single one of you. Because once again, once again, you've changed my life. This is as it was. Okay, fine. Come on, Harry. We want to say goodnight to you. By the end of the year, I was still not clear what I thought about Harry Styles. And I definitely ended the year more down on him than I started. All his rock star poses seeming like empty flash. But when he kicked off the Harry's House era, I cannot deny that it was such a relief after the year started with such a drought of new music. It was like the year had finally started. And God, what a relief it was. You know it's not the same as it was. Considering how self-consciously cool the rest of the album was, the way he chose to lead it off strikes me as very stark in hindsight. From about 2007 to 2015, every few months there would be a kind of joyous crossover indie hit where some little band would accidentally write the catchiest song ever written. Harry Styles may be the first person in history to have a fluke indie hit on purpose. I think it's insanely cool that the biggest pop star alive is reaching the Phoenix or Best Coast as his inspiration. And it's really saying something that for a guy who sold himself all year as your sexy, beautiful, glamour boy, he kicked off this era with a song about being a depressed shut in. Why are you sitting on the floor? What kind of pills are you on? I feel like that's yet more shadow from the pandemic. And possibly the darkest one yet if even Harry Styles is being affected by it. If even he, at 28, is writing songs that make him sound like a 45-year-old divorced man. I think you can make a case for this song as the song of the post-pandemic. Where the worst is over, but, you know, it's not the same as it was. This felt like it was at number one forever, and I was completely on board. I was surprised at first because it didn't feel like your classic mega hit with the big unstoppable pop book, but it's one of those songs that just kept getting better and better the more you heard it. Just like the song itself builds in momentum. Like my favorite two seconds of the year is the drum fill right after the chimes kick in. This song was probably the biggest song of the year and it felt entirely deserved. I've talked some shit about Harry, but he earned his way into people's hearts this year. Like, maybe things aren't the same as it was, but this is pretty good, too. By the way, this riff sounds nothing like Take On Me to me. I don't get what any of you are talking about. Number two. As years go by, I find it harder and harder to tell what is actually cool or hip to listen to beyond the very obvious. Especially since, as I repeatedly tell all of you, I don't actually enjoy listening to music, and I especially don't enjoy talking to people who do. That's why I like chart watching so much. No personal or emotional reactions, just cold, hard numbers. Spotify charts are especially good, because they include older songs in there so you can see what actually has legs and what the kids are actually listening to. Boy, you guys really love the neighborhood, huh? And here's one I noticed. It was consistently very high on the charts for months and months, and... I'd never heard of him. Like, who's that guy? Some indie artist, I guess. Wonder if he's ever going anywhere. An annoying thing about modern pop is that it doesn't seem to have its own identity. It feels like all of the 2020s have been calling back to 70s disco or 80s synth pop. And if you ask me what the sound of now is, I'm not sure I'd have an answer. This is partly why I like Unholy a lot more than I should. At least it sounds like something new. 
But in terms of pop hits that sounded modern and good, there was only one real contender this year. I bite my tongue, it's a bad habit. Steve Lacey was part of the band The Internet, which means he was sort of loosely affiliated with Odd Future, you know, Frank Ocean and Tyler Creator and all them. And since Frank resolutely refuses to make another album, I guess this is what people glommed onto as a substitute. This was probably the biggest TikTok hit of the year, and TikTok gets 10 songs wrong for every one it gets right, but the songs it gets right, it gets very right. I don't honestly know what to call Lacey or his sound. Wikipedia lists like 15 different genres for his music. Like it's alternative, it's R&B, it's neo soul, it's indie rock, it's jazz, it's funk, it's biscuits, it's gravy. But that's only fair because it is all those things. Can I bite your tongue like my bad habits? He's got that indie rock guitar groove but with a very smooth, soulful voice. It's a combination of alternative sounds I haven't heard ever cross over. And boy, what a great and weird sensation it was hearing Kate Bush and Steve Lacey back to back on the pop stations this year. Like what a truly fantastic revenge of the nerds moment. Now let's be clear, this is a song for nerds. It's about being a sensitive shy boy who gets lucky and wins out at the end. Maybe the best of its kind since Pretty Woman, except it's also actually smooth so you don't feel like such a dork listening to it. You grabbing me hard cause you know what you found is biscuits, is gravy that The thing is, I don't necessarily know if Steve Lacey is going anywhere. Cause you know, this is a guy whose biggest buzz before now was getting a guest appearance on a Vampire Weekend album. He could just end up the Gautier of 2022, but I certainly hope not. If this song has not spawned dozens of imitators by next year, we have done something wrong. And before we get to the final entry, some honorable mentions. Okay, this is my guiltiest pleasure of the year. Like sometimes I dislike an artist so much I'll start rooting for them to prove me wrong, which is probably why I'm a lot kinder to this song than I should be. But I, you know, I like Imagine Dragons a lot more now that they've hit their nobody likes me, everybody hates me phase of their careers. Traveling around the world. Over the phone, driving to Call this the unofficial number 11 of this list. Like, I probably don't need to hear any more Future or Drake team-ups, but I did like this a whole lot. It introduced me to Thames, for one, and it's been interesting to watch Drake's trademark bitterness and regrets take a more tired, middle-aged tone. I got a career that takes my time away from women. I cannot convince you that I love you for a living. When Drake is 50, he's gonna make the saddest music ever made. Stupid boy making me so sad. Most improved, you get a gold star and subtextually positioning yourself as the beta to Olivia Rodrigo's alpha, that's just smart branding. That's a niche that someone needs to fill. Does not count. That's an 80s song. And if I did count it, it would have crushed the competition. That's just not fair. I could do this for hours and hours and hours. Okay, was this 2022 or the year before? I can't remember. Anyway, I like this one a lot. If only for the fact that she kept coming up with different rhymes for the word hours. I wanna give you your flowers and some champagne showers, all the shrimp and lobster towels. But it's me that gets devoured. That's songwriting right there. <laughs> You know, I liked all the mid-tier singles from this album a lot more than the big hits. I don't know. It's fun. She's not a lesbian for a piece, she turned lesbian. I like you, my ass. Not the best idea. This song came out too late in the year for anyone to put it on their year-end list. For the record, I probably wasn't gonna put it on the list either. I just wanted to say that I love this album very much, and if I made album lists, Scissors SOS would be right at the very top. Be in hell than alone. And now, let us see what topped the list. 
Number one. My entire moral code is a need to be thought of as good. It has been six years since Taylor Swift's castle, as she put it, crumbled overnight. In hindsight, that description seems a little overdramatic for what now seems like relatively minor drama, but at the time, it was pretty devastating for a woman who was already the most tightly wound celebrity in showbiz, and one deeply invested in her public image. Famously, she responded by killing the old Taylor, and the new Taylor wound up taking on many forms. She was the villain, and then the hero, and then finally the award-bait critical darling. It was a bumpy ride, but at the end of it, her empire was stronger than ever. Her castle had not crumbled at all. It had proven that it could stay standing even when its foundations began to shake. Not only is Taylor Swift still on top, she will always be on top. And with her position in the public eye now forever secure, we can now see what all of this has done to restore Taylor Swift's peace of mind about her place in the world. Nothing. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. At tea, time, everybody agrees. Maybe you're the problem, Taylor, was a common joke during her dozens of breakups era. And it was a funny line because it really seemed like this was a realization she would never come to on her own. Taylor was always the fairy tale princess or the wounded victim, and she would only be critical of herself sarcastically. I'll stare directly at the sun, but never in the mirror. Anti hero was obviously something much, much different. And I don't necessarily think it's Taylor having any major epiphanies about herself. She's not self reflexive on anything here, except her own inability to self-reflect. It sounds more like she has come to this sad self-realization through cold, hard logic. Tea, time, everybody agrees. If everyone is wrong about you, why do they keep saying it? Why do they think that? If you were this great, blameless person you thought you were, wouldn't your life be different? Wouldn't you be happier? Empirically, the problem has to be you. I wake up screaming I have talked a lot about Taylor Swift over the years, but despite that, I've always felt a tiny bit detached from the Taylor phenomenon, especially her first few albums, which did zero for me. And I just figured, you know, eh, not for me. It's for Taylor's demographic. I just don't relate to it. Probably I shouldn't relate to this either. I'm not a megastar, and I'm not driven like she is. I'm lazy as shit, as you can tell by the fact that this list is three weeks late. But even if I can't relate to Taylor's insane drive and ambition, I do totally get being a deranged insomniac haunted by doubts and lost friends. When my depression works the graveyard shift all of the people, I've ghosted stand there in the room. I recognize a whole lot of my own demented thought patterns in there. When you're awake too late and you're so consumed with regrets that you're not making any sense. And by the way, I respect Taylor so much for presenting her insane midnight ramblings with no rewrites to make it more accessible. Sometimes I feel like everybody is a sexy baby and I'm a monster on the hill. Sexy baby is the lyric of the goddamn year and if you think it's a bad line you are not listening to it right. It must be exhausting always rooting for the anti-hero. I think the word anti-hero haunts Taylor. She wanted to be the hero. She tried very hard, and it's not going to happen. She knows she'll always be the lead character, she'll always have followers, but they'll never see her the same way. A person can't work that hard to stay at the center of the story and keep their image untarnished. When Taylor Swift was 20 years old, she wrote a song about how someday she'd be big enough that no one could hurt her. And now she's bigger than anybody, and she's more fragile than ever. She can only see herself as a monster, or as some comically unloved, unlikable person of power who can command attention but not affection. I have this dream, my daughter-in-law kills me for the money. She thinks I left them in the will. The family gathers around and reads it, and then someone screams out, she's laughing up at us from hell. Taylor's attempts at humor don't always come off. That verse is the funniest goddamn thing I've ever heard. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. 
This song just absolutely knocked me over the first time I heard it. I could not believe what I was hearing. Antihero is about a lot of things, about self-doubt, about being lonely at the top, and just the frustration of having no solutions to the problem of being yourself. I, I realize that on some level this might be another pose, a public act of self-loathing to make herself more sympathetic. Did you hear my covert narcissism might disguise as altruism? Like, I don't think she thinks she's a fake charitable narcissist. And the fact that she is so aggressively pushing this song, even releasing a bunch of bonus remixes to block Drake from the number one spot, doesn't exactly disprove her being a narcissist. But there is something very real in it regardless. For the first time, I get you, Taylor Swift. I mean, I'm older and not any wiser too. I feel you, Taylor. Hi, it's me. I'm Todd. Thank you for watching. I'm totally going to the Eras tour, by the way. I haven't bought my tickets yet, but I will find a way. But never in the mirror, it must be exhausting, always blue.